And organic chemistry is for me uh, the center for chemistry. The imagination is more important than knowledge. If you're a scientist in academia, you have rock and roll every day. You don't need so much money. Knowledge is, of course, important. If I don't understand organic chemistry, I cannot be an organic chemist. But if I want to be in science successful, I need to be creative. Hi, everyone. Our guest today is Thomas Carell, uh, the professor for organic chemistry at the LMU University and also the senator of the LMU University. Thank you very much that you found time for us and we really appreciate it. And um, as far as I know, you also run an own lab. How, how is it? Well, I'm running a large lab. So first of all, thank you, Vlad, for the opportunity uh, to talk a little bit about my science. Well, I'm operating a lab with about 30 people. So we have an international team uh, of, uh, of 25 PhD students, five postdocs, and they work in, in different labs, organic chemistry labs, cell culture labs, biochemistry labs. That's what I'm operating. How is the whole workflow uh, in the lab organized? Like um, how, for example, you set the direction of your future research? Uh, so the group is divided in four subgroups. Each subgroup uh, contains uh, between five and seven, sometimes eight members. And each subgroup has a very specific uh, scientific goal. And we are meeting with the subgroups basically every week and we are redefining the goal. And, we are designing the experiments that are needed to reach the goal and, um, and then in this team we are creating the new questions that we want to investigate. What are the current questions? Like what are the most topical questions and uh, topics of your research right now? So we have one subgroup that is working on medicinal chemistry and here we found a new mechanism that may allow us to uh, uh, to uh, bring relief to patients that suffer from AML. And we also have in this subgroup the goal to design and to develop new molecules which allow us to stimulate or destimulate the immune system, which is also important for anti-cancer treatments, but also in order to treat uh, autoimmune diseases. So this is one subgroup. The, the second subgroup um, has the major goal to, um, to look a little bit at the origin of life. So this is a more philosophical subgroup. Um, or questions associated with the subgroup where we ask the question, how could life emerge on, a, uh, on, a, on an early Earth planet? We had, for example, yesterday here a speaker that, uh, that from, from geoscience and uh, he told us about how we should envision an early Earth and, and then we try to find uh, chemical pathways that, that allow uh, the molecules of life to form, to form under these, uh, these uh, difficult prebiotic conditions. So these are the two, uh, the two main questions of two subgroups. And then I have two subgroups that are more biologically oriented and they have other major questions. That's actually very good that you have been talking about the origins of life because I have some questions about it. But before that, I would like to know like, what in your opinion are the best qualities for a young student uh, to be a potentially good organic chemist in the future? Like, what, what is the portrait of an ideal student for you? Oh, I think uh, uh, an ideal student has, of course, excellent grades, which tells me that he understands his topic. So he is a master of, uh, of, uh, of organic chemistry. So that's, that's for me a, a conditio sine qua non, that somebody understands what he is doing. And, and the second main, uh, main criteria is for me curiosity. So uh, I would like, I, in my group, I like to have students that are not so focused, for example, I want to go to industry, give me a project that makes me very attractive for industry. Some of these people apply to my group and I'm a little bit reluctant taking such students. I like students that come and say, oh, this is a very interesting question, let's start and let's see where we end in three or four years. And, uh, and then we go from there. And finding a position was never a problem. So people from my group have always found a good position. But, uh, but I like to have open-minded people that, are, that, that show a high level of curiosity. But maybe there are some distinguishing features of exactly organic chemists, which, which makes it different from biochemists or you know, organic chemists. Well, organic chemists like to create their own world. Yeah, we make molecules that do not exist in nature and we use uh, chemical pathways that uh, were not explored in nature. Of course, in the connection of, uh, of this prebiotic science, I mean, prebiotic chemistry, just to stay in that, on that example, 
has gained tremendous importance. And, and why? Uh, because we see now all these exoplanets. Yeah? We have just launched, so mankind has just launched the new James Webb telescope, and uh, in June we will get the first data. And we, we have now more than 5,000 exoplanets were, were, uh, were discovered, and uh, we will learn about the atmospheric compositions. And then, we, then the physicists come and say, Thomas, look at this. This is an exoplanet. Yes, this, this is this size. This is the composition of the minerals on his surface. This is the planet. Can life occur? And the organic chemists have to find an answer for that. So we need to explore the chemistry, chemistry that may have never existed on the, early, uh, on the early Earth, but we have to explore what type of chemistry is possible under these conditions. Of course, the rules of chemistry are universal, but under these conditions, what type of molecules can form, and are these molecules able to create something like life? Yeah. Why do we need, actually, this knowledge? Like, we can live perfectly also without it. So is it just a scientific interest, or maybe we can apply that somehow later? Why do we fly to Mars? We can live without flying to Mars. Why are we... If, if the mankind destroys the Earth, maybe well, we will leave it. No, Mars is not a good solution. Yeah? We have a very thin atmosphere, uh, no, almost no water, at least not no surface water. No, uh, no. I think in this solar system, it's very hard to find a planet that is more habitable than the Earth. I think it's curiosity. I mean, we all want to know from where are we coming, why are we living, what's the reason that we are existing on Earth, yeah, what's the driving force for creating a, a human being, yeah, what, what, what is the, who is profiting from that, so, uh, or, uh, and, and where are we going? I mean, these are questions that are around since uh, humans have started to think. Yeah, where are we coming from? Where are we going to? I think they're very fundamental questions. Yeah, and we need to investigate them, of course. To the question, where are we coming from? How did you end up actually in uh, organic chemistry and not in any other field of chemistry? Uh, well, I had also the option to study medicine uh, and uh, I had to decide between the two topics. And uh, I started with chemistry because it was possible, when you start with chemistry, it was possible to cross over into, into medicine at my times. And, uh, and vice versa, that was not so easy. So I started with chemistry because I didn't want to decide, make a decision. Said, okay, I shift the decision into the future. But then chemistry went so well, the grades were so excellent, it was so easy for me uh, to study chemistry that I simply stick to it. And I fell in love with it. And organic chemistry is for me uh, the center for chemistry because we are creating uh, molecules like plastic molecules, although they are maybe at the moment have a, have a bad reputation, but, but nevertheless, and we can explore uh, chemistry that, uh, that is new. Uh, can you make new molecules, create new chemical pathways? So it's a little bit like architecture. It's, it, it has, there is some artistry behind it, architecture and creativity to design molecules and to synthesize them. I would also like to ask you what's actually more important for a young student to be a good uh, at maths uh, because you have to do a lot of calculations and so on or to be rather creative because that's the root of everything. I think for me uh, creativity is the most important or to say it with Einstein imagination is more important than knowledge. This is a very very uh, classical saying from Einstein. I think that's very important. Knowledge is, of course, important. If I don't understand organic chemistry, I cannot be an organic chemist. But if I want to be in science successful, I need to be creative, particularly as an organic chemist, because I don't need to design my molecules. I have to design my chemical pathways. Since 2019, you are also a member of the supervisory board at BASF. Correct. What's your function there? What are you doing there exactly? I'm the scientist. Uh, BASF is one of the few companies that uh, has a scientist in the advisory board. They want to be informed about what are hot topics in science, what is governing uh, scientists at the moment, what, uh, what are new trends, 
And I think they also want to be a little bit in connection via the professor to the young generation. So I'm very often reporting how my students are looking at a specific problem. What do you like more, to work in academia or to work in ministry? I like to change between both worlds because they are very different. I, I'm a very curious person and I like both worlds. I think they are very different, but all of uh, both worlds have their advantages and disadvantages. And um, yeah. Okay, what are the advantages of working in industry? Oh, yeah. safety, you have a safe salary, interesting questions, very nice and safe environments. You can create, uh, you, you can go directly after your PhD into industry and then basically you can shape your life. You can marry, get children, construct a house or buy a house, purchase a house and just just uh, just live your life. Yeah, that's that's the advantage of industry. And then you can move up and you can can earn a lot of money. But it sounds to me like life without rock and roll. Well, if people work and then they take the money to to get their rock and roll, they go skiing, they go to Thailand on vacation. I don't know what they are doing with their money. So they they uh, they earn the money and with the money they pay for their rock and roll. Yeah? If you're a scientist in academia, you have rock and roll every day. You don't need so much money. <laughs> yeah? I mean, that's, that's it. Okay, what is your kind of rock and roll? What are you doing? Well, I love science. I had, very, I, had, I had a lot of offers from industry. I could have gone after PhD, after my postdoc. Also, when I was a professor, I got offers. I always declined these offers. I like to be a free person. Who creates, uh, who creatively designs new projects and uh, and then finds young, interested, enthusiastic people that help me to uh, uh, to, uh, to 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 walk into these uh, scientific uh, unknown areas, and this is extremely challenging. It is extremely rewarding. It is super super. It's just super interesting. It's every day something new. The students come in, tell me about new data, and in the evening I cannot sleep because I need to think about the data. Yeah? So I'm, I'm an enthusiastic uh, university scientist. Aren't you boring because of your mind being full of information 24-7? I mean, your, your brain. Isn't your brain exploding because of that? We are using only a fraction of our brain, right? I think we use only 10%. There's a lot of space for good ideas and a lot of uh, space for storing knowledge. No, Is it I'm true? Because I, I always thought th these talks about uh, people using only 10% of their brains is bullshit. I don't know. I'm, I'm not a brain expert, but I think our brain has, uh, has a very high capacity. Of course, I feel sometimes exhausted when we have a guest like yesterday he gives a one and a half, a one hour's lecture, then we are discussing science, then we have subgroup meetings here with the subgroup, and we are discussing again science and new ideas uh, until about four or five o'clock, and then you go, you, you may go f for dinner with him, of course in the evening you are exhausted, but I mean, you get so many new information, it's just great. It's, I think I love it. I don't like a bored, yeah, I don't like to be bored. Yeah, the opposite is what I love to do. Um, self-organization of a living cell. Uh, it's, for me, obviously it's not an instant process uh, because it was an evolution and so on. But at the same time, a living cell cannot function without any constituent uh, part of it, any organella and so on. Does it mean that um, the self-organization happened instantly, like in the moment? Because or maybe you, you can explain it better because... I think I understand it. You, you say, okay, I need all this complexity, if I, if I got it correct. Exactly. I need so all the complexity of a cell. At, at, at how, 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 how can something that complex evolve? Mm. I, because I need all this. Mm. Yeah, so it must, it, it must pop up immediately together because only together it can create a cell. And I think this is, uh, this is fundamentally wrong. So if you have a cell, you have a nucleus or you have DNA, the DNA need to be uh, transcribed into RNA if, or, or you have already an RNA genome and then, uh, and then you need to create messenger RNA and then you need a ribosome and you need to make proteins and you need, uh, you need enzymes to make the proteins. So you need, a, in order to make a cell, you need a lot of uh, already very complex processes. 
and you need them all. You cannot take this part away or this part away, then the whole cell cannot form. So the question is, how can evolution, cre evolution create such a cell where every individual part is essential? It basically requires that all these parts were created at the same time, found each other and then created something like a cell. And I think this is a fundamentally wrong uh, uh, conception. Why? Because it is impossible that a, a very complex, let's say, uh, mitochondria developed here and cell nucleus developed there and then this came together. I think this is, no, I think life started and, uh, and it's a question of how, do you, how, how to define life. Life started in a very slow and a, in a very gradual process. So first of all, we had an early Earth atmosphere and we had rocky, rocky surfaces, volcan volcanic eruptions. And, uh, and then we understand at the moment pretty well how the molecules of life were created. Nucleic acids, amino acids. So they, they, were, in, they were, let's say, forming and present in ponds. And then they created something that we call today an RNA peptide world. So the RNA molecules, they formed, uh, they, 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 they formed uh, um, chains. And then on these chains, this is what we believe, and we have a paper that is hopefully soon accepted. Uh, on these change, uh, chains, we had peptides growing. And then this, this creates molecules composed out of RNA and peptides. And then these peptides, uh, they gained the function, for example, to help RNA to grow and to, to make RNA more stable. And the RNA molecules, they learned uh, to make uh, the peptide growth uh, at their backbone more efficient. And so this then created potentially larger and larger and more complex RNA uh, peptide conjugates. And then you are already in the regime of the complexity of a virus. A virus is nothing else than RNA packaged around uh, proteins. And this is what, you, what we have just created. And, uh, and, then, and then these particles, they got larger and larger, and they learned, for example, to maybe the peptides at the surface became very greasy, and this allowed the system to assemble uh, lipids around them, and this led to compartmentalization. And then at some point, the RNA and the peptides got so large that the RNA peptides lost their covalent connection so that we have the proteins and the RNA separate. Yeah, and then some of these proteins learned to, to make proteins on RNA and so forth. So it was really a very slow and gradual process. And, and the, the first primitive life forms were maybe not life forms uh, as we know them, but, uh, but it was maybe just a lipid shell and inside you had something like a replicating RNA surrounded by proteins. Yeah? So maybe this was the beginning. So of course there was no thinking, there was no complex machinery, and, and maybe all this on, on, iron, on, on, on pyrid surfaces, of iron, on iron two surfaces, which could have provided the energy. Yeah, so something like this. Does it mean that it is impossible to um, reproduce the self-organization process of a living cell in laboratory conditions? Well, I mean, of course, we can grow cells in the laboratory. So we can, cells are growing constantly, also in my cell culture lab. But uh, the question is, can we, can we emulate, can we create molecules that can, that can self-replicate? This is a very important question and not easy to answer. So, uh, in 1986, a very influential paper was published, published by Gilbert and he in Nature, and he called that paper the RNA world. And, um, and he postulated that life started with pure RNA, RNA molecules that, uh, that self-replicated. And then, by self-replication, there were mutations and selections, and these self-replicating RNA, RNA molecules became larger and larger and more complex and more complex. Since 1986, scientists around the globe are trying to find self-replicating RNA molecules. And the success is very limited, very limited. We were not able in all these years to find a good replicator. And, um, and this, at the moment, 
leads, uh, start, yeah, yeah, we are starting to questioning the RNA world. And we have, that's my group, we are just, we are at the moment postulating this RNA peptide world because we found that RNA has the intrinsic property to decorate itself with peptides. So uh, we, we found a very e an easy mechanism of how RNA can grab peptides from solution, can attach or amino acids can attach the amino acids to RNA, and then these particles can grow, can attach more and more amino acids to the already present amino acid, so that the amino acid by amino acid is forming a chain, forms a peptide chain. And the paper is currently, the, the review process is over, we, we, we still don't have the final acceptance letter, but we are expecting it in the next couple of days, and I think this has the potential to change a little bit the idea about how self-replicating started. So it's a it's a complicated it's a complicated question and uh, and an unsolved chemical problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we think that maybe these RNA peptide chimeric structures that they have the potential to be better replicators. But this has to be shown in future research. So this is really cutting edge research at the moment and we are now here at the table looking into the future. Yeah, this is what we want to show. That RNA peptides can chimeras can self-replicate. Clear. About DNA, uh, the topic which uh, especially your lab is dealing much with, um, you also succeeded as far as I know in synthesizing new DNA bases. How was it possible? Which methods did you use, and uh, why, why? What's the practical uh, application demand of it? Okay, so this is uh, so if you are uh, if 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 a, if a cancer is diagnosed, many of the compounds that are given in the frame of a of an anti-cancer therapy are so-called anti-metabolites. These are nucleoside analogs like decitabine, for example, which is one of these anti-cancer drugs. These molecules, if you take them, they are converted in your cells in the corresponding triphosphates, and then these molecules are incorporated into the genome. So the cancer cells grow, they create new DNA, and, and so they take these, these uh, uh, medicines, yeah, convert them into triphosphates, and then integrate these molecules into the genome. And what, what these cancer cells, the, the genome of these cancer cells are subsequently full of these modified nucleosides, and so they cannot survive and die. In order to understand what is the effect of these molecules inside the genome, you have to chemically synthesize a piece of DNA and incorporate this drug, this nucleoside, artificial nucleoside, into the, into the DNA strand. And, uh, and then you get, let's say, a, a piece of DNA where it is, at a specific position you have these, uh, these anti-cancer drug sitting. And then you can study how does it affect the stability of the DNA duplex? How does it affect uh, the structure of the DNA duplex? How does it affect binding of important proteins to DNA? And at the end of the day, you learn how is this compound killing the cell. Yeah? What is the ultimate uh, the mechanism of how this compound kills the cell? So how are we doing this? Well, there is solid phase oligonucleotide synthesis, so organic chemists can synthesize DNA and RNA strands. The chemistry behind it is called phosphoamidide chemistry, so you need to synthesize these uh, medicinally relevant molecules as phosphoamidides. And then we have a DNA synthesizer here that allows you uh, to incorporate them into, in, into a DNA or into an RNA strand. Now this is how what we, so you need organic chemistry to make the phosphoamidides. These are 12, 15 step synthesis, so really hardcore organic chemistry. And then we use solid phase chemistry uh, to put the building blocks into pieces of DNA and RNA. This is what my group is doing all the time. Mm -hmm.